So thank you again for coming tonight to hear the gospel, good news from God. You know, God loves each of us so very much and has provided a way of salvation, opportunity to have your sins forgiven, not based on something we've done, but all on account of what the Lord has done at the cross. So we're happy to share it with you. What's on my heart tonight is the thought of the courtroom. You know, in a courtroom, you've got a judge and you've got the prosecutor. He's the, he or she is the lawyer representing the crown in, in Canada's case and representing the law and prosecuting the accused. You've got the defense lawyer who is putting up a defense, the best defense that the accused can have. And then you have the accused themselves. So I'd like to look at two court cases in the Bible, our court case before God, the Lord's court case, and then we'll also look at the Lord's teaching on a court case as well. So turn with me, please, to John chapter 3. John chapter 3, verse 16. These are the words of the Lord Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Just turn with me, please, over to Romans chapter 3. For two verses, Romans chapter 3, verse 19. This has got to do with the law. Romans 3.19 now we know that what things soever the law says, it says to them that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. And just turn with me, please, back to Luke Chapter 23. So we've read about our court case. We're going to look at the Lord's court case. Luke 23, verse 1. And the whole multitude of them arose and led him, that's the Lord Jesus, unto Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ, a king. And Pilate asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answered him and said, Thou sayest it. Then said Pilate to the chief priests and to the people, I find no fault in this man. And they were more fierce, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Jewry, beginning from Galilee to this place. Let's just drop down now to verse 13. He is sent to Herod, and Herod finds no fault in him and returns him to Pilate. In verse 13, and Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people, said unto them, You have brought this man unto me as one that perverteth the people. And behold, I have examined him before you, and have found no fault in this man, touching those things whereof ye accuse him. No, nor yet Herod, for I sent you to him. And lo, nothing worthy of death is done unto him. I will therefore chastise him and release him. For of necessity he must release one unto them at the feast. And they cried out all at once, saying, Away with this man, 
and release unto us Barabbas, who for a certain sedition made in the city and for murder was cast into prison. Pilate, therefore, willing to release Jesus, spake again to them. But they cried, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. And he said unto them the third time, Why, what evil has he done? I have found no cause of death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. And they were instant with loud voices requiring that he might be crucified. And the voices of them, of the chief priests, prevailed. And just one final reading back in Matthew chapter 5 or two verses. Matthew chapter 5. Verse 25, this is the Sermon on the Mount, the words of the Lord Jesus. Agree with thine adversary quickly while thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. Verily I say unto thee, thou shalt by no means come out thence, Till I was paid the uttermost farthing. Well, may the Lord bless to us the reading of his word. So we've been considering the court case. When we think about our court case, you know, we're all accountable to God. God is our creator. And one day we will stand before him. Well, we read in Matthew, in John chapter 3 that we are all condemned in our sin, condemned already. You know, usually in a court case, the accused is brought, as we were saying, the prosecutor is bringing the evidence. This person was seen at the scene of the crime and the defense tries to present an alibi and the defense, uh, the accused stands there. What do you plea? And the judge has to evaluate. Is this person innocent or guilty? But God has already evaluated us. Because he sees us. There's nothing hid for him. There's no evidence that needs to be brought before and decide, did we really sin? He knows. And we're condemned already. It reminds me of Belshazzar, the king of Babylon. He was living in sin and at this particular time was involved in sinful activity. And the message came through Daniel. And Daniel told Belshazzar, God has numbered you, your kingdom, and has finished it. You are weighed in the balance and found wanting. Do you ever wonder if God weighed us? What would he find? Would he find us wanting? The Bible says that we're condemned already. Why? Well, we've all sinned. We've all done those things that dishonor God. Maybe it's thought we've had. Maybe it's words we've said. Maybe it's actions we've done or our attitude, our pride. And you know, we could go through the list. Have you ever told a lie? I'm sure if we're honest, we all very likely have. God says that's a sin. And God says you're condemned already. Have you ever stolen something? Perhaps something small, perhaps something larger, maybe at a store or from a friend or a relative. God says, that's a sin. And he says, condemned already. Have you dis ever dishonored your parents? It's easy to do. They want you to do something. They want you to be, you know, do a certain action, perhaps a chore or something else. And you have words to dishonor your parents. It's easy to do. God says it's a sin. Condemned already. Have you ever lusted, sexual lust, for someone else? God says it's a sin, condemned already. Have you ever had pride in your heart? Oh, look at me. I can run fast. I can play music. I can do art very well or something else. And you lift up yourself in pride. Maybe you're the top of the class and it marks God says pride is sin, condemned already. You know, if we're all honest, we look into ourselves, review our past, 
we have to find there are things that we're ashamed of, things we've said, things we've done. God says they're sins, condemned already. We have to agree with God, condemned already. What about good works? You say, well, I'll I'll try to keep the law. I'll try to, you know, be a good citizen and and do do right to my neighbor. Nothing wrong with that. But that doesn't that doesn't undo our sin. It's like the bank robber goes to the bank on Monday and robs the bank. And then on Tuesday, he gives blood at the blood bank. Does that make his good deed? Does that undo his bad deed? No. He still has done the crime and needs to do the time. There was a man in Colorado, Mr. Sheeman, and he was caught speeding. And he wanted to fight the ticket, so he went to the, the court trying to fight the ticket. And he was found guilty of speeding. And he was going to have demerit points applied to his license. And so trying to plead with the judge, he said, can I give to charity? And it would absolve me of these demerit points. No, you can give to charity, nothing wrong with that. But you're still going to have those demerit points on your license. Condemned already. We read there in Romans about the law. You know, we can try to fulfill the law, and the law is a good list of things that God expects. But we have to admit that we we failed at fulfilling the law. In fact, the law isn't so much a list to do in order to get to heaven because we can't. It's rather it's a mirror to show us that we've failed to meet that list. And the Bible says that every mouth will be stopped. Think about that. There will be no one standing before God with excuses and trying to negotiate. Say, well, God, you know my upbringing. And it was because of those circumstances. Or I was just amongst my friends and I just went along with whatever sin it was. No one will be there with an excuse. It says every mouth will be stopped. And it says all the world will become guilty before God. So there's no one excluded. And so it's not of works. We can't earn our way to heaven. So we're in, in desperate situation. We've all sinned. We're condemned already. There's no good works that can undo our sin. And there's coming a time for the sentencing. We read in Hebrews, it's appointed unto man once to die. After this, the judgment. Are you ready? Are you ready? It'll, it'll be a fair judgment. God is absolutely just. He will be righteous in his rulings. There was a man who had purchased a transponder. It's a little device you put in your car and it allows you to go on toll roads and you pay a monthly service so that you can go on the toll roads. And he set it up and it was working fine. And then he started to get these bills. As he was commuting daily on these toll roads, he started to get these bills of that he had been going on the toll roads and hadn't been paying. He thought, well, that's not right. I paid for this transponder and I pay a monthly fee for it, but the device had stopped working. And so there's a, a scenario of injustice where he's already paid for it and he was getting extra bills. God is not like that. He will be absolutely fair and just with his sentencing. And we read in Revelation 20 about that great white throne when the, the dead, small and great, will stand before God. And the books will be open, and the dead will be judged from the books according to their works. It's not a judgment to see, will I go to heaven? No, that judgment's been made, condemned already. It'll be a judgment to the severity of punishment. Those that have done smaller sins, smaller punishment. Those that have done greater sins, greater punishment, but nevertheless, it's an eternal punishment. And we lovingly warn you of it. 
And so this is our problem. We're condemned already in our sin. That's our court case. But let's look at the Lord's court case. There, the Lord Jesus, we read in John chapter 3, he didn't come to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Why didn't he come to condemn? Because we're condemned already. He, he didn't need to fulfill that duty because we we're already condemned. The law already condemned us. But he came to save. He is the loving Savior who came to save. We read that famous verse, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I was reading recently of a spacecraft called the New Horizons. It was released in 2006, and it took nine years to get to Pluto. And on July 14, 2015, it flew by Pluto, taking thousands of photographs. Up until then, we could see Pluto from a telescope, just a blurry dot, maybe this size. And then there's the Hubble telescope, which is a telescope in space, is able to see a little better, but again, not very, very clear. So this was a, a, an interesting spacecraft. The first time we're gonna get flyby photo footage, photographs of what does Pluto look like? And you can look at it online. It's a relatively small planet, it's dark, mostly dark. And but it has a big white patch, and they think it's an icy spot on it. But what's interesting is that ice patch is in the shape of a heart. Uh, isn't that special? There, at the, at the extremity of our solar system, when God looks on our solar system and on Earth, he sees Pluto, and there is that heart. It just reminds me of God's love for us. You know, God loves us so much. And each of you is so very precious. We're each made in his image. He doesn't want any to perish. He wants us all to be saved. But we're condemned already. And so the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. He didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Oh, he's such a loving Savior. He wants to save you. He wants to forgive you of your sin. And so we read of his judgment. Pilate declares... I find in him no fault at all. Pilate was a seasoned judge. He had seen criminals brought before him, thieves, murderers, those in, caught in insurrection against Rome. He knew the pattern. They would come, they would argue, it wasn't me, I would, I'm innocent. But it's not so with the Lord Jesus. He comes and the, the Jewish leaders are accusing him. He's causing problems. He's stirring up the people. He's forbidding to saying to forbid to give to tribute to Rome. <clears throat> the Lord Jesus, who didn't say that, he's silent. And Pilate marvels, you're silent in front of your accusers. And Pilate recognizes this man is innocent. You know, why is it important that he's innocent? Because he had no sin. If he had sin, then he would be dying for his own sin. But he had no sin. He was sinless. He's God himself, manifests in the flesh. This makes him fit to be our substitute. If he was sinful, he couldn't be our substitute. He would be dying for his own sin, but he is sinless. And so at the cross, he is dying for us. He's taking our place, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. We read, who his own self bare our sins, his own body on the tree. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. Chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. And so salvation is found in him. It's found in Christ. It's not found in joining a church, giving of money, or in doing any such good deed, though nothing wrong with doing good deeds. That's not salvation. Salvation is found in Christ, his work on the cross on our behalf. We read the wages of sin is death. That's the consequence. That's what we deserve. 
The wages of sin is death. He took our death at the cross. He died for us. Because he paid the price, we can be forgiven. I was thinking of this passage we read in Matthew. The Lord is teaching. There's judgment coming. There's an adversary. And he says, I agree with that adversary while you're in the way. Because there's a time coming when he's going to take you to court for that. And you will be cast into prison. It's basically saying, there's your, your window of opportunity to get the matter settled. Because there's going to be a, a point in time when it's too late. And it's so true with you and I and God. God says we're condemned already in our sin. We need to view ourselves in that light. We need to come before God in repentance. The Lord Jesus said, repent and believe the gospel. We need to come before God and view ourselves in that light. Say, Lord, I'm condemned already. I am the one that have sinned. And you're a holy God. I can't go to heaven with my sin. I'm condemned already. The Lord Jesus said, repent and believe the gospel. We need to put our trust in him. He has paid the price for sin, for the sin of the world. It's available to all, but it's only upon all that believe, only those that come into the good of it, to trust him. What did we read? He that believes on him is not condemned, but he that believes not is condemned already. So we need to put our trust in him, not trusting in our goodness, we have none, trusting in him, his work on the cross. He died. He really did die. He was buried in three days proved He was had died. He died for our sins. And he rose again. It proves that God was satisfied. It's like you were in the courtroom and the judge says, you've got this stack of speeding fines. Very serious. You need to pay them. But then along comes a friend and pays them for you. You can go free. The fines have been paid for. We have a mighty friend, the Lord Jesus, who has paid a price sufficient for our sins. Will you accept him? Will you come to him? Will you repent and believe the gospel? I've given this illustration before, but I think it's very fitting here. In July of 1794, in Paris, this is during the difficult days of a revolution, it was known as the Reign of Terror. One night, a young man named Jean Simon de Louis Riol, he was put into, into this prison. He was arrested, put into this prison, a very large, damp dungeon, dark, and he was to be put to death the next day. In the night, an older man was wandering through that prison room, and he spotted him, and he recognized, that's my son. And the older man, the father, says, what can I do to save my son? I don't want my son to die. And he's thinking, he's thinking, what can I do? He says, well, I have this, happen, he happened to have the same name, Louis Simon de Louis Riol. And he says, you know what I'll do? When the roll call comes for those to be taken for judgment, he says, I'll go in his place. And so he was praying that the son wouldn't wake up and that he would be able to go in his place. The next morning, that's exactly what happened. The door opens, the guard calls out, Jean-Simon de Louis Riol. The father stands up and he goes. And he comes to the desk. The man says, are you Jean-Simon? Age 37, he says, well, my name is Jean Simon, but I'm 73. And the guard said, Oh, silly mistake. And he corrected it. 37 made it a 73. And he scratches the name off. And here's another one who's going to be put to death. And he was. Jean Simon was led, led out. And at the time, they were using the guillotine. And so he was killed. Later that morning, the son wakens up and he's wondering, when, when will I be called? And he talks to a fellow prisoner, and the man says, well, your name was called, and an older man stood up and went. 
And Zhao Simon said, but that's me. And he recognized it must have been my dad who went for me. He took my place. He died for me. And shortly thereafter, the reign of terror ended and the prisoners were set free. So he was set free because his father died for him, took his place. Jean Simon, the son, lived. You know, the Lord Jesus has died for us. He has taken our place. He has taken our judgment at the cross. The wages of sin is death. He took our death. He bore our sin so that we could be set free. We come in him, to him in faith, repentance, and in faith we trust what he has done. Lord, you, you died for me. I take it in. I believe it. He that believes on the Son has everlasting life. Will you take it in tonight? Why not come tonight while there's yet time? Good evening and welcome to the gospel meeting here and online. I know experience for me, I've never preached online ever. So this is a nice thing to be. <laughs> uh, and happy Father's Day for all you fathers out there. I know this is not something we normally say from the gospel uh, platform, but yes, it is. Uh, and I have a reason for saying that too. You know, 39 years ago, God became my heavenly father, right? There was a time in my life when he was unknown to me and I heard the gospel and I obeyed it. I took it seriously. And 39 years ago, he became my father. You know, fathers, as my son would tell you, they can be a little bit disappointing. <laughs> and uh, I call up my own father. He lives in New Zealand and he says, well, I don't know why you're calling me, because it's not Father's Day in New Zealand. <laughs> so I say, well, happy Father's Day all the same, Dad. I'll call you again in October. So, <laughs> so anyway, my brother and I, Steve, we didn't, we didn't plan this thing together, but I had a verse on my mind, and uh, it's John 3.16. You know, if, if there was only one verse in this whole book, it was John 3.16. We could preach till the days are done. John 3.16. So um, our brother here was saying too about the heart on, Mount, uh, on, on planet Pluto, not planet anymore, I guess. Uh, it made me think of two years ago, I'm sure all of you heard about Porto Peak in Nova Scotia. 22 people died, sadly, the tragedy of Porto Peak. And one of the things that happened was a man by the name of Dimitri Neonakis, a pilot uh, of a little Cessna plane. And maybe some of you might even know what I'm talking about. And he and his girlfriend were flying the plane that night. And he said, I could think of something I want to do for the people of Puerto Rico who was in so much grief, so much shock that that time. It, it took the whole, I think it took the whole province and the country into shock that someone could do that in a little town for Puerto Rico, Nova Scotia. And so he, he did his little flight path. You know what a flight path, those of you who fly planes, you have to tell, you have to tell the air controller where you're gonna fly, you just can't fly a plane anywhere. And his flight path was the shape of a heart. And when he finished it that day, that flight, the air controller said, hey, do you know what you just did? And he says, yes, I know. I flew the flight path in the shape of a heart just as a little tribute to the people of Puerto Rico. What a wonderful thing to do. I want to talk about this thing called the love of God. John 3, 16, there are probably many verses that you and I can look into the word of God, but I was thinking of this great subject of the love of God. And what better verse than John 3, 16? So let's, I know you've read it before. I know you know where it's, it is in your Bible. It's like furniture in the house, you know, you can almost, Close your eyes and you can still find it. John 3.16 is one of those verses, right? So if you open, if you have a Bible, open it, please. You know, it's the word of God that will save you. It's not my words. It's not what our brother said that will save you. It is the word of God, right? And you need to read the word of God. 
In the King James Version, which I will be reading from 25 words in John 3, 16. We'll read it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. 25 words in John 3, 16, 12 about God and 12 about me. We sing that in Sunday school. And John and, and son in, uh, uh, 12 about God, 12 about me. Um, and, uh, and son in the center, John 3.16. So that's a simple uh, uh, chapter. There's just four things I want to talk about tonight. Um, I want to talk about the consciousness, the consciousness or the comfort of God's love. Um, I want to speak of the cost of God's love from John 3.16. I want to speak of the call of God's love. And I want to speak of the certainty of God's love. Just four things. Very simple. I hope it's even the, the youngest of us can hopefully uh, understand what I'm trying to say. You know, I'm the visitor in this town. And like most visitors, we <laughs> go to all the visitors' sites. Um, and one of the places I, I was walking past yet again was the National War Memorial in downtown. I've been there more than once, and I actually was looking for a special plaque there. And of course, this is the plaque of Nathan Cirillo. Nathan Cirillo. And it's hard to believe. Uh, <laughs> there's a woman called Carol Off, and for those of you who bother listening to CBC, uh, Carol Off retired in February uh, 2021. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, this, sorry, this year, February 2022. And, and you know, with the kind of work that I do on a family position, and when I'm done work, sit in my car, switch it on, turn on the radio, CBC comes on, and it, if it's past six o'clock, after the new 6.30, it's always Carol off. And, um, and she was retiring, and they were all celebrating Carol off and saying, you know, Carol, you've done so many interviews, 16 years of, you know, speaking to people. What was the most, is that interesting? What was the most in memorable interview that you've done that you that you will always remember. And she said, there was a time when I spoke to this woman by the name of Barbara Winters. She was the Ottawa lawyer. That was the first person that came to Nathan Cerullo's when he was shot on October 22nd, 2014. And she looked at him and she knew that death was not far away. And what did what did Barbara Winter say to Nathan Cerullo that moment as she was holding on to him and she knew that death was not that far away? What do you think she said to her? Some of you might even remember her words on that sad moment. She said to him, I told him that he was loved. I told him that he was loved. You know, <laughs> sorry. It, it still touches my heart when I think of that. When I heard those words, I thought of my future speaking. I told him that he was not. You know, there's so many people in this world that need to hear this. Not just that they are loved by a fellow or a person. And, you know, Nathan Cyril had his dogs and he had, I'm not sure if he was married. I can't remember all the details. But I know that there were people that loved him and still loved him. And the last thing he heard from Barbara Winters was that he was loved. And today, I hope it's not the last thing you hear. But if you hear nothing at all from John 3.16, please hear this. That God loves you. For God so loved the world. He didn't love the world of rocks and mountains, even though they are beautiful. He loved the world of people, of humankind. For God so loved the world. So the consciousness of God's love. The cost of God's love that he gave his only begotten son. The call of God's love that whosoever believeth in him. You know, that's a call from God tonight. And if you're sitting if you're sitting there and we've heard that call before, you know, just before I came, uh, we were staying in a hotel and of course, the alarm goes off. 
How many times have you heard the smoke alarm staying in the hotel? What do you do? You run down 17 floors <laughs> because of all this. No, I tried to call the front desk and the front desk didn't answer the phone, understandably. And then finally this announcement comes, we are trying to find out what's happening to this thing. And we'll let you know later on if it's, and of course, it was a false alarm. And I think of false alarms in my life and how many times I've heard smoke alarms go, staying in hotels, which I sometimes do. I don't exactly run out when the smoke alarm goes off. And maybe I'm speaking to someone tonight and you're hearing a little alarm go off in your head. And you say, I've heard that one before. <laughs> Uh, and for a minute, you say, I'll, I'm, I'm going to do something about it. Yeah, I, I might have to pack up a few things and don't take the elevator because that's not a good idea. I'll run downstairs and you say, uh, I'll, I'll just wait a few more minutes. And you know what? It's going to go. It's going to stop ringing and it's going to get better. And it, there was no fire. That happens to so many of us. I remember before God saved me, that was my little thing too. I've heard this one before. You know, it'll just cause a little bit of a anxiety attacked in my heart and then it'll go i'll just wait long enough it'll go and you don't get saved you know one of these days it will be the right it will it will be the real thing it will be the real thing and there are people who are going to be caught because they thought it was just another false alarm so god is calling that whosoever believeth in him and the certainty of God's love is that whosoever uh, that, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So, so four very simple thoughts there. For God so loved the world. You know, God's love, I say it's not like, like my love for, for, for people I love. And I hate to say this, but, you know, sometimes we love because we are loved. We are loved. It's hard to love someone that, number one, you don't know. It's hard to love someone that doesn't love you. It's even harder to love someone that hates you. You think about it. Just put yourself in that moment, that, that position. And when you think about that, it's then you, 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 you'd be so amazed at this love that God has for you and I. Um, God know, knows you better than you know yourself. He knows me better than I know myself. So that little thing about it's hard to love someone you don't know, but it doesn't apply to God because God knows everybody in this room. And he knows you better than you know yourself. He knows you better than your mom or your dad knows you. You know, people say, I know him better than he knows my than me. Well, hey, God knows you. And yet God still loves you. Amazing. Um, it's hard to love someone who doesn't love you back. Think about it. Yeah, I mean, you know, the people we relate to in this world that we say, I love you or, or, or we love them, it's because they mean something to us and, 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 and they love us back. So, so, and if they, you know, you just don't walk on the street and, and tell someone I love you, they'll think you're really weird. So, yeah, you don't do that, do you? And, 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 and God loves you. There are people... For 18 years in my life, I didn't love God. I didn't know who God was. I thought I knew who he was, but I really didn't. And yet, God loved, loved me. You know, not only did I not love God, oh, I hated God. And if you are one of those people tonight, and you think you can stand on the fence on this great subject of loving God, and you say, and you're not saved that's never been in your life a time in your life when god saved you you really don't love god the bible says we were god's enemies wow that's pretty strong and yet these people that hate god you think of all these men and perhaps women who've gone on 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 places like this and, and they've spoken out against God in, in the strongest way, in the horriblest way, in the most demeaning way, wicked ways. You know what? I can still tell them with a straight face from the word of God that God loves them, even though, even though they hate God. And that is the love of God. That is the, you know, if you've never, there's a, there's a picture of a young woman that, 
you know, I think a lot of us will remember, she was just a little girl. And she lives in Canada, and some of you might know, she's a Vietnamese girl from, and her name is Fan Thi Kim Phuc. It's a kind of a hard name to say. And she's the girl that was burned with a few other children with napalm when Americans were there. And that's that picture that won the Pulitzer Prize, that famous photo of the four kids running down, you know, the, some unknown road in Vietnam. And there was a book that was written about her. It was called Fire Road, The Napalm Girl's Journey Through the Forest of War to Faith, Forgiveness, and Peace. Guess what happened to her? Guess what happened to her? This girl that was, she was over 90%, full thickness burned. No wonder she didn't feel any pain. All the nerves were, set, were seared by napalm. And here she was running down, you know, some unknown street in Vietnam. And, you know, she lives in Canada today. I've heard, I've, I've, I haven't really read every, everything, but I know that she's, she, she lives in Canada. And her ministry is the Ministry of Forgiveness. And she said, I think this is what she said. She, she, was, she was sitting and she was listening to this man preach on the love of God. And I think it was John 3.16. And she said to herself, she says, imagine, I never knew that there was anyone who would love me. And she was so disfigured. She has all those scars that she carried. And she really thought that she was unlovable and there was no one to love her. And in that gospel message, she heard that God loved her. Isn't that wonderful? And when she found out that God loved her, she started to listen to the message of the gospel. And so God saved her. So tonight, my friends, God loves you. You can take this message to any part in this world. I was saved in Malaysia. I'm speaking to our brother Blaze that I went to find out where he comes from, Benin, yeah, found out where it is on the map. You know, there's some people who don't even know where Malaysia is, but that's fine. You know, wherever you are in this world, I can take you a message of John 3 16 that God loves you. So the consciousness of God's love, it is as the theologians would tell us, agape love, unconditional. God doesn't need you to love him back to love you. God doesn't uh, need all these strings that sometimes come with love. I will love you, but if you do this or if you love me back, none of, none of this applies to God's love. God will love you 24-7. God will love you at any time because God is God and he is love. God loves you. The cause of God's love that he gave is only begotten son. Um, you know, how, how do I know, my mom passed away now, but I used to use this example. How do I know my mom loves me? How do I know my mom loves me? Is it just because she said she loved me? Yes. Well, you know what? Maybe not. <laughs> it's not very common in Asian cultures, for those of you that know. Yeah. You know, maybe in the Western culture, the expression of love is something obvious, but it's not said much in Asian culture. I you know, really have to scratch my head real hard to think how many times mom actually said that she loved me. But you know, I wouldn't doubt one moment that mom loves me or loved me. And why would you, why would I say that? How, how do I know that even though she never said, Kenny, I love you, she did in the end, you know, she did. But how did I know my mom loved me? Just from the things that she did was the proof of her love for me, right? Love is something that is more than just saying it. It's doing it, right? So how do I know that God loves me? How do you know that God loves you? What is the proof of God's love in John 3, 16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Yeah, that is the cost. You know, love it cost the Lord Jesus Christ, it cost God the Father to prove his love to you and I, that he gave his only begotten son. You know, I will, there's a lot of things that have value in this world. I remember years ago, uh, visiting the, uh, the, 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 the British, uh, uh, crown and, and all those things. And, and I learned, in that little tour of, in London, 
that they're not insuring those things. All, all those things that you ever go for the tour, and you see all these crowns and British royal things, they're not insured. And the reason why they're not insured is very simple, because you can't put a value on them. How can you insure something that you can't put a value on? So <laughs> once again, I thought, well, you know, there are a lot of things that you may not be able to put a value on it, but hey, I'm sure you put the right price on it, you, you can buy the British crown. But there's something that is absolutely, absolutely without value because you cannot put a value. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. The, the father loved his son from eternity past. We, we cannot even enter into this, the greatness of, of, of the, the, the Trinity. Um, all the, the wonders that exist between the father, the son, and the spirit of God, and the love that exists long before you and I even existed. We, we look at this world today and we are so amazed at how complicated, how complex, and yet how everything just comes together in its perfect way. But even before anything came to pass, there was the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, and they were in perfect harmony. They were in perfect unity. They were in perfect mind, and they were in perfect love. Then you and I came along. And we spoiled everything. Starting from the Garden of Eden right down to today, you know, no one is getting any better. I hate to burst your bubble. Things are just getting worse. Even the um, people who don't believe <laughs> in creation or God, even they will say things are getting worse. They are. And they, you just have to open your eyes and be real about it. And so there came a time. For God to prove his world, his love to this world that really did love him, that didn't want him, that hated him. But this world that God loves, loves is the world that had to be saved because of sin. It was something that had to be paid because of sin. And, and the only person, the only way that God could have fixed this problem is by sending his son into the world. And so the Lord Jesus Christ came into the world he suffered and died at a place called Calvary. And in doing so, he has paid in full. I was thinking of my mom, right? My mom was one of those people who never could let you have a meal and not pay for it. He's one of those people, you know, always had to pay the bill. I said, why? What, what's it about? And there was a time I remember when she ate with her brother, my uncle, and he snuck out and paid the bill. Was she mad? And she was asking the boss at the, the Chinese restaurant, I, I have to pay this bill. And he said, you can't pay the bill, it's paid. He wanted her to reverse the thing so that she could pay the bill. You know what? God has paid through the Lord Jesus Christ that, that amount that you and I could never even, for all eternity, pay it. Even, even if we could try and do something, it would take all of eternity, and we still wouldn't be able to pay. And in three hours of darkness, Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross paid in full, the full debt of your sin. He died to save you and I, and God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You know, um, we can't start to imagine. I mean, we in, in human relationships where... You know, we, we care for each other, we love each other, and, and the loss of someone that matters to us is, is such a painful thing that I, I wouldn't even know how to try and express that in, in human words. But the loss, when the Lord Jesus Christ died on Calvary's tree, that separation that happened in those hours of darkness, I couldn't, I couldn't even imagine. Because God's relationship with his son was a relationship that you and I will never understand, that we could never even appreciate. It was so precious and so strong and so unique. But the only way that you and I would be saved, I was gonna look for that thing behind me, but it's not here. And saved from a lost eternity, from hell in the lake of fire is, 
the Lord Jesus Christ dying in Calvary's grave. And God proved that at, at Calvary by giving his only begotten son. What is the call of the love of God? <clears throat> that whosoever believeth in him. What does that mean? Whosoever believeth in him. You know, I, I, <laughs> I, I work in a profession where uh, some people just don't believe in me. <laughs> and so they spend a bit of time and we talk about things and then they go and go see someone else and see what they think. They say, they call it a second opinion. And I say, that's fine. It's a free world. I'm not perfect. So if you don't believe in what I'm trying to help you with, then you can, you're always free to, to get a second opinion. Right. And that's fine. That's human relationships and human interactions. But you know, God makes no mistakes. He is a perfect God and everything that God does is absolutely perfect. And when the Lord Jesus Christ finished everything that needed to be done on Calvary's cross, there was absolutely nothing else to be done. I did a little Sunday school in Hubbard's Point for, you know, for those of you who understand, it's an end of one. There's only one child in Sunday school. I saw your Sunday school today. I said, wow, they have a lot of kids. <laughs> we have one child at Sunday school. And every second or third Sunday is my turn to do Sunday school for one child. And my lesson was, it is finished. Yes, it is finished. You know, it's, it's wonderful. The, the more you dig into it, the, the, the more wonderful the word of God is. So, you know, it is finished. There was a picture of, of a man waving the, the chocolate flag, you know. There was a man hitting the, the line uh, of the Boston Marathon, for those of you who know what that is. When you get to that line, you reach the finish line. It is finished. And I, I in my Sunday school lesson, I told this little boy. I said, you know, he was the only person that reached the finish line. It's not like he was the first person. He was the only one that reached the finish line. No one ever reached the finish line. The Lord Jesus Christ did, and he said, it is finished. There were other things about the, the it is finished thing. We had a picture of graduation. You know, it, you can't just run a race and pick shortcuts. And there are rules and regulations to it, right? When the Lord Jesus Christ says it is finished, he did everything according to the, 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 the rules. He didn't break any rules. He didn't bend any rules. When a picture of graduation, young people graduating, they were celebrating their graduation. And that is exactly what it is finished also means. That he finished, the he, 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 he accomplished what he accomplished and he kept the rules. And it's almost the same as he graduated. So, so that was the other thing about the thought of being it is finished. And, and of course, we talked about this money thing. You know, the handshake, when you finish a deal and you shake the hand and you say, it is finished. We've agreed on what the terms of the contract are and everything have been agreed on both sides and we, we do the handshake thing and it is finished, right? And when the Lord Jesus Christ finished the work at Calvary, that is exactly what it was. So it was a final thing and everything had been done just according to what God had expected or, 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 or from, from for the, the terms that human sin might be dealt with. He finished it that way. So what else is there? And then finally, we had a bunch of paintings. And everyone thought they would look at the Mona Lisa, the famous painting of uh, Leonardo da Vinci. And, and, and they thought well, it wasn't the Mona Lisa. There were uh, little changes to the Mona Lisa, you know, and, and it is finished. And you've heard this. They say that when the artist finishes, there was a time when he finished and he stopped painting and he said the Mona Lisa is complete and if anyone comes and puts an extra dub of paint on that painting you know what it becomes f-a-k-e you cannot change a finished painting without making it fake 
And there are people today who think, you know what? I like this thing that Jesus Christ has done on Calvary's cross, but I like to put a little bit more paint on it, please. I like to look, make it look a little bit this and a little bit that. I'll put a little bit of my idea into it. And you know what it becomes? An FAKE, a fake. When the Lord Jesus Christ says, it is finished, it is finished. And all God expects you and I to do to come into the good of that, that work on Calvary's cross is the call of the love of God that whosoever believeth in him. You just take it as it is. It's a gift, right? It's a gift. You just trust the Lord Jesus, believe in him. You don't need to do anything more. You cannot do anything more. And please don't do anything more. Or as it just becomes a faith. The certainty of it that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Wouldn't that be wonderful if someone tonight, whether online, whether sitting in this room, and you hear the message of God's love? Have you never heard this truth that God loves you? Have you never heard of what it cost him? that he gave his only begotten son? Have you ne never heard of what he's asking you to do because to, to come to the blessing of it, that is simply entrusting or believing in him. 100% guaranteed, should not perish but have everlasting life. You know, there is never going to be a time when, as it were, that painting or that race is all those things that we were talking about it is finished when when god will say oh you know what it wasn't finished i i, I should have done this never you know 39 years ago just a young boy young man sitting in a gospel meeting in a place many many miles away from here and i heard the truth from the precious word of god i'm going to show you my ipad you know what it's this it's this book that's what saved me, the word of God. And tonight, John 3, 16, not my words, not my thoughts on, my, on those words, but John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You know that song, John, that we were talking about, Who's, that whosoever surely means me, Surely means me, surely means me. That whosoever surely means me, surely means even me. Shall we pray? Our Father, we thank you again tonight for the wonderful truth of John 3.16. We know that there are many who will be in heaven and their uh, claim to uh, the truth of God that spoke to their hearts and opened the way to heaven to them would be John 3 16. We thank you for this wonderful verse. We thank you it came from the words of the Lord Jesus, uh, from the lips of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you tonight that once again we've been able in uh, great weakness speak on this verse. And Father, we realize once again that the power of salvation is of the Lord. It is of thy word. They were born uh, not of corruptible seed, but of the incorruptible, even the word of God. And Father, we pray tonight that it would be the experience of some sinner that they might hear thy word and that they might trust in our Lord Jesus Christ. We give you thanks for this. And we thank you for our Savior in his worthy and precious name. Amen.